So welcome to Algonquin lands and to the country of Canada, a reminder of how First Nations history is intrinsically bound up in all of you who call these lands home. Canada is a First Nations word. It means village. But the first peoples of this land have been excluded from this village for far too long. We have been receiving less and judged as if we get more. This past week, nine people die in a house fire. In a house that has no water. A First Nations woman dies in a river outside of Thunder Bay. I testify at an inquest and I, uh, regarding the deaths of seven young people who at the age of 13 had to leave their homes just to get an education. And I see teenagers saying, it's too late for my childhood. It's too late to be treated equally. But it's not too late for that baby born today. It's not too late. You know, there's Andre. <laughs> you know, uh, one of the things that most caring Canadians don't understand is that we are in the midst of a civil rights struggle. We are a racist country. It was born out of racism. We have the only race-based piece of legislation in the Western industrialized world called the Indian Act. And most Canadian Canadians don't even think about it, doesn't even make a ripple on the conscience of the nation when they hear that. In fact, they think it's a perk card. They think it's a perk to have your blood quantum measured by the government to decide whether or not they think that you meet the criteria to be an Indian or not. And then they also assume that there's a whole pile of uh, bonuses that go with this lifestyle. But what a lot of Canadians don't understand is that First Nations children on reserve receive far less public services than every other Canadian. And the reason for this is that provincial child welfare and education laws have displaced First Nations laws. And that itself is a matter of controversy because these laws have not proven to be benevolent for First Nations children. But nonetheless, they apply. But the federal government funds these services on reserve. And since Confederation, they have underfunded every single service. But they've done something even more damaging. And that is a injustice not only to First Nations, but to non-Aboriginal people too, who were raised on a diet of stereotype and misinformation that led not caring non-Aboriginal peoples to believe that not only First Nations people on reserve got more, but they weren't grateful for what they received. They weren't grateful for what they received. Now, a nine-year-old little girl, she told me the best definition of discrimination. She said, discrimination is when the government doesn't think you're worth the money. I want you to think about what it would feel like if you were that child that was not worth the money, but is being judged as if they get more, or the parent of a child who is not worth the money who is being judged as if you get more. And then I want you to think about how long you'd be comfortable waiting to be treated equally. How many budget cycles would you be comfortable waiting for your child to be receiving the same quality of education that every other Canadian enjoys? A clean glass of water from the tap. Water to be able to fight a fire. How long would you be willing to wait? See, that's a danger of incremental equality in Canada. That's when you have cross-cutting inequalities. At every budget cycle, someone comes along and says, we're going to give a few hundred million dollars to First Nations peoples. Or overall, we're giving all these billions to First Nations peoples, and it sounds like a lot of money, and it is. But what they fail to mention is it would be a lot more if we were non-Aboriginal people. That comparator is never brought into the equation. This is a report, it's written about First Nations education in Ontario, the very same subject I was testifying at the inquest about. It's written by a man named Alex Sims for the Government of Canada. And in there he talks about the dramatic inequalities in First Nations education that are undermining the hopes and dreams of a whole generation of children then. The year this was written, I was one of those children. 
This was written in 1967, and I was three years old. He calls for respecting Aboriginal people's calls for justice and fixing the system, and providing equity in education. And then he calls us out and he says, can Ontario really afford to wait for glacial change in equality? Let someone hazard a guess as to what year or what century significant changes in the achievement of the children will be noticed. How long do First Nations children need to wait until they're treated equally? One of my greatest heroes asked that same question. She was 13 years old the first time I met her. Her name was Shannon Kustachin. She's a First Nations girl from Attawapiskat, Ontario, and unlike many Canadian children, she had spent her childhood trying to fight to be treated equally. You see, the school on her uh, community was put atop a toxic waste dump of over 30,000 gallons of diesel fuel. The government of Canada cl closed it because it was a class one toxic waste dump, but then they put portable trailers to act as schools on the playground of that contaminated waste dump. So where Shannon went to kindergarten was only a stone's throw away from there that contamination was. It was supposed to be temporary. Three ministers of Indian Affairs across two different political parties promised these kids a new school and they didn't deliver. Now Shannon was not an expert in politics. And although she wanted to grow up to be a lawyer, she wasn't one yet. But this much she understood. In her tree teaching, she was told that real leaders keep their promises. And she could not understand how people who were calling themselves leaders in Ottawa would break their promises to children. Because the portable trailers were getting run down over time, there was ice building up, so thick that the, the kindergarten children had no hope of escape should there ever be a fire. There was rats, there was black mold contamination, and as Shannon herself said, children as young as grade four were, falling, uh, were resigning from school because they had no hope. They had no hope. She decided she would do a YouTube video and she'd call out to Canadians. She believed, if you only knew, if you only knew, you would do something. She asked people to write letters, and those who did write letters were children, but many of us, we didn't write those letters. And when she was 13 years of age, she had to make a choice that many other Canadian children never have to make. And that is she either stayed in the community she was in with the underfunded ed education and never be able to become the lawyer that she wanted to. Or she leaves her home at the age of 13 to, become, to go to school hundreds of miles away so that she could get the same opportunity your kids enjoy. It was on the road one night back to that school in New Liskert where she would have never gone to school had the one in her community been properly funded, that she dies in a car accident at the age of 15, never having seen a school built in her community. Now, people would say, well, the school was eventually built, and that's true, but the inequalities continue to exist, where First Nations children get 30% less for education than every other Canadian child. And then we have universities trying to recruit Aboriginal students, but really remaining silent in the face of that racial discrimination that bars them from being able to enter into the four. But that's just one stone in the backpack of First Nations children. Their disadvantage is manifested across all areas of their childhood. As Sheila Fraser noted, there isn't one real element of First Nations children's lives that's untouched by this inequality. When they go to the doctor, they get less. When they go to the, the, the family support area for child welfare, they get less. When they go to the TAP, they get less. And this has been going on because we have not been able to face as a conscience of the nation the fact that we are racially discriminating against people. But turning away from it doesn't make it less real. Turning away from it does not make it go away for these children. And turning away from it erodes the national consciousness. Racism diminishes all of us. I got a, uh, I've been getting a lot of mail lately from caring Canadians, many of whom don't understand. And they write to me and they will provide solutions, almost as if they think that we don't know what the solutions are. 
And so we don't know about the problems in First Nations. All we need is somebody to send us a newspaper clipping and the whole thing will be solved. Now these people are well intended. At least they're engaging in the conversation. But this is a good example. We had worked for over 10 years with the federal government documenting the inequalities in child welfare. Now, more importantly, coming up with evidence-based solutions. And the federal government did not implement it. Just as in Sims Day, they know about the problem, they know about the solutions, but they only want to partially implement equality or they won't do it at all. So the question is, what do you do about that? What do you do about it as a First Nations NGO? Well, we had some great advice at the Caring Society when we started. An elder told us, never fall in love with the Caring Society and never fall in love with your business card. Only fall in love with the children because there may come a day when you have to sacrifice both those things for them. And that day came for us in 2007. We realized that we could not do another study because children's childhoods don't get put on hold while studies happen. And we knew that during the time we were sitting at that table in the previous 10 years, the number of First Nations children going into child welfare care had increased to staggering 71.5%. There were more First Nations children in child welfare care then than at the height of residential schools by a factor of three, and that's increased since then. Why? They're driven there by poverty, Poor housing and caregiver substance misuse related to residential school trauma made worse because they get less services in child welfare than every other Canadian citizen gets. So what do you do about it? Well, we filed this human rights case. We had a bit of a uh, suspicion that should we file it against the government that we would lose all of our federal funding. And that happened within 30 days. We are still the only national nonprofit serving Aboriginal people that receives not a dime from the government. But you know what? A lot of people said you will never be able to succeed in this case against the federal government because they're so well resourced and you only have $50,000 in the bank and you've lost all of your funding. And I said you might be right, but I want this generation of children to know that I love them enough to fight for them. And it's our uh, job as adults to stand up for kids. And even if we fail, we will succeed at least at that. But by a miracle, we were able to succeed. And on January 26th of this year, the federal government has found to be racially discriminating against 163,000 children in this country and ordered to stop. And ordered to stop. I've often said, I don't know why I had to take the federal government to court to get them to treat little kids fairly. I still don't understand that. And I don't understand at all why they fought so hard when they knew the facts themselves. They never disagreed on the facts. They don't disagree that they're discriminating. And this is one of the documents that really shows when a child is not worth the money. You can think about overrepresentation of First Nations children as they're 12 times more likely to go into foster care, and that's true. Or you can think about it the way that kids themselves think about it, which is how many sleeps till I see my mom. That's the way that kids in residential schools used to think about it. And if you add up the number of nights of First Nations children in, in Canada, on reserve, in the Yukon, have spent in foster care in 1989 to 2012, it's over 66 million nights, or 187,000 years of childhood. That is the price of waiting. That is the price of not rising up and demanding that equality is the floor for First Nations children, not the ceiling. Not the ceiling. This is a document inside of the federal government where they're showing the shortfalls in First Nations education or child welfare. And as you can see, it's not because they don't know it exists. They know it exists. This is what racism looks like in a PowerPoint slide. But when you don't address it, it becomes even worse because when you see it, when I see it, we need to be those adults that stand up for kids. We need to show them that even if the government doesn't think they're worth the money, we do. And we will do everything in our power to make sure that we actually live the spirit that's embedded in this nation and make sure no child is left behind, right? Because leaving kids behind and allowing inequality to exist is deadly. 
This is another some example of how racism looks in a PowerPoint slide. Remember that horrible fire that happened this week with the nine people who perished? Well, you can see that budget infrastructure. That's the government's budget for First Nations water, housing, sewer, and fire protection. And what the government has been doing is that the services for education and child welfare and, and social assistance are so underfunded, they've been transferring $98 million a year that's allocated for fire protection and water and housing out of that budget to cover off the shortfalls. Imagine if that had not happened. Could we still be blessed with those nine lives? Could they still be here? We'll never know that answer, and we can never turn back the clock, but we can stop it from happening again. Here's another child, a First Nations child on reserve, an example of a document where the federal government is showing us that if you're a First Nations child on reserve and you require a wheelchair, a lift, and a stroller, you get one of those items every five years. Imagine yourself 15 years ago that's how long it would take in order to get that piece of equipment. Imagine a baby. Let's take a baby born today. They would have to be 15 before they get all those pieces of equipment. Now, I'm not like a doctor, like many of the people here. But even I know as a child development person, or even as a citizen, that children grow. Right? Children grow. If this child is off reserve, just across a line, it's not a question of remoteness, just across the reserve line, they get all those pieces of equipment when they're medically required in this region. So why is it that a First Nations child is not worth the money? The most dangerous thing about this discrimination for the First Nations children is that they internalize it. They start to believe that they're not worth the money, especially when the rest of society is telling them that they're getting so much more. Why aren't you pulling up your bootstraps? What about your First Nations leaders? They're not able to manage the money. If you just tried hard enough, the message is, you could be as successful as we are. But that's not true. If we applied to conditions we applied to First Nations people, to other people in Canada, we would be seeing these same devastating outcomes in a matter of years. But we have normalized it. We've normalized it on reserve. We've normalized the idea in many communities you have to walk two kilometers to get a thing of water. And we've normalized it off reserve, where we will do fundraisers for people in Africa who have no water, but we will absolutely excuse that same situation here at home. And we do that by saying it's too complex. Whenever we say that, it is a mass for not doing anything. Don't you ever think about it for a moment? You know, why is it so complex to get clean water to Tanaganega, an hour and a half outside of Toronto? And yet, when there's an earthquake halfway around the world, we can get clean water pumping with a DART team in 24 hours. Why is that? Why can't we get clean water to people here in Canada? People say, well, people, First Nations people live in these far-fun places. That's why the inequality exists. But that's not true. A lot of First Nations people live, our communities are proximal to urban centers or in rural areas. And even on the remote argument, do you ever notice that the only time that crops up is when the government is talking about people? They will never say that strip of uranium is too remote. <laughs> we can't get to it. Those oil sands are too remote. If we can get a Twitter feed to a guy up in outer space for Pete's sake, we can get an education to a child up in northern Ontario without having to send them away to go to school. You know, uh, stopping racism and discrimination just takes seeing it. It's like the, putting those, almost the, the horrible fingernails on the blackboard of the Canadian consciousness, that's how much it needs to hurt for you to pay attention to it. Because it's so hard to think of ourselves this way. And we want to be nice. So when the budget came out this last year, and they said $71 million for child welfare, even I felt some peer pressure to be grateful for that amount. But the danger of incremental equality is that falls far short of that figure that we saw in that PowerPoint slide, doesn't it? 
I asked a CBC reporter, I said, if you were one of those kids who is getting less, or you're the parent of one of those children who is getting less, would you be grateful? What does gratitude do for inequality? It makes everyone feel comfortable with it. And in my view, there's no excuse for giving one group of children less than every other group of children because of who they are. It is something that we as a people campaigned against in apartheid South Africa, that we stood with uh, the courageous African Americans as they took on the civil rights movement, but we still have our Confederate flag flying. And our great gift we can give to the country is to take that down before Canada's 150th birthday. To say to the Prime Minister that you can be a good and great leader, not by how many trade deals you sign, by bringing the country into alignment with its values, and that we as a people know that that might mean we can't build that new stadium, that that might have to be put off for a few years until we can give every child an education. But I absolutely believe in the caring nature of Canadians, and I think you're like me. I think there's a lot of taxpayers like me that are, don't want to walk into a stadium paid partially with the racial discrimination against children. <laughs> Shannon Kustachin is worth the money. Those nine people who died in that house fire are worth the money. That little child who's been waiting for the next five years to get his wheelchair is worth the money. The only bankruptcy we need to overcome is not in the financial treasury of the nation. It is in our Canadian consciousness to rise up and be the country that we want to be. So be that best example for your child. Show them that you will stand up for kids. Not just your kids, but your neighbor's kids too. Because if we finally do that, then Canada has finally reached its promise of truly being a village. Thank you.